Administering File and Print Services Part 2. In this continuation of our previous nugget, we'll examine three more aspects of this critical role service of Windows Server 2003. We'll begin with a discussion of backup and restore functionality. We'll then revisit the notion of the quota, this time spending most of our time with a feature that we saw in Windows Server 2003 and then was significantly bumped up in the R2 revision and then carries over into O3. And then we'll finish with a flourish, as I've said before, by looking at print service functionality. Now disk quotas, again, is the volume or NTFS quota that you're used to in the release to manufacturing version of Windows Server 03. We're going to review the directory quota or the resource manager quota stuff that we looked at in the last nugget. Print services, if you've been working with Windows Server 2003 R2, you're already familiar with the print management console. If you haven't used Windows Server 2003 R2, then you're in for a treat because the print services in R2 and now in Windows Server 08 make deploying printers a breeze. It's an absolute joy to deploy printers to your users now. It's wonderful. I think we'll have a great time in this nugget. Backup and restore functionality in Windows Server 2008. Now, of course, since we're not in a live classroom together, I'm not sitting face to face with you. I kind of wish we were, because I always like to know with my students where you come from, how long you've been with Windows Server products and technologies. If you go back as far as Windows NT 3.51, Windows NT Server 4.0, you remember the good old NT Backup utility. And then moving into Windows Server 2000, and then of course 2003, and then the R2 addition to Server 2003, and now of course we're in Server 2008, we've seen a gradual upward movement, whoops, that's not quite an upward arrow, but you get the general idea, in terms of robustness, feature set, and flexibility, in terms of the backup and restore capability that Microsoft gives us in box with Windows. So what we have in Windows Server 2008 is the graphical user interface, the Windows Server backup tool. This is, as you would expect, a tool that supports your traditional full backup, which will back up either the complete server, all locally attached fixed disks, as well as USB or FireWire attached storage devices, can support incremental backup schemes. That's your graphical user interface. And by the way, you can get to your Windows Server backup remotely as well. We'll discuss that shortly. Just you'd be sitting at your Vista workstation and you can fire up a Microsoft Management Console and you would make a connection to your Windows Server box through the MMC. No muss, no fuss, etc. NT Backup always supported a command line variant. Of course, you know that the command line version of your GUI tool is important for scriptability. So here in Windows Server 2008, we have a brand new, actually a couple brand new command line tools Instead of ntbackup.exe, which was always our mainstay with backup and restore functionality in Windows Server, we now have this tool called wbadmin. Know this for your exam. This is an exam alert, everybody. Please know that your command line interface to the backup and restore tool in Windows 08 is wbadmin. And you need to not only recognize that, but have a basic familiarity with the major switches that we use with that tool. Also know that Backup and Restore in Server 08 is exposed to PowerShell. And if you're not familiar with PowerShell, this is a technology that Microsoft's really proud of. It's a scripting command language. I like to define it as a command shell. It's a free download that gives you the flexibility and depth and power of something like VBScript, Visual Basic Scripting Edition, with the ease of use of something like your traditional shell script or your MS-DOS type batch scripting language. So you can leverage PowerShell commandlets to tap into 
the Windows Server 2008 backup and restore functionality. You won't see references to PowerShell on your exam though, so don't worry about that. Just focus on the Windows Server backup GUI, the fact that you can tap into that remotely, and also the WB Admin command line tool. Now then, how about some of the benefits of the Windows Server 2008 built-in backup and restore tool? Well, I've covered some of those. We've got a simplified interface. It's easier to do ad hoc or scheduled backups and restores of individual files, folders, so forth, as well as complete PC backup and restores. You still have the ability to backup your system state, in other words, the Active Directory database, your registry files, if your server is a certificate server, you can back up your certificate store. All that good stuff is still there in Server 08. As I've mentioned before, you've got easy remote administration capability. You don't have to create a terminal services connection to the backup server to administer it. You can administer it from any workstation in your domain, or from home for that matter. We've got support for removable media used to be that backup in Windows Server was very, very limited. In other words, you could back up only to either just a .back file. In other words, back up the server to a single file, which presented a huge point of failure. If that .back file became corrupted, your backup was hosed. Or you could back up to tape, and that tape drive had to be physically attached to the server. I mean, it was just horrible. Now you can back up to a tremendous variety of removable media, iSCSI or USB 2 or Firewire. So Microsoft has really gotten pretty contemporary, pretty current as far as the connection technologies that are supported in the Windows Server 08 backup tool. And also speaking of connection technologies and disk write technologies, the volume shadow copy service is supported. So we're able to back up shadow copies Backup is done at the block level, so we've got a really low-level backup. VSS is also used in SQL Server products and technologies backup. Before we hop into our demo, let's sweep up the proverbial shavings by looking at some backup options here. As I've said before, when you kick off the backup wizard, or if you were using WB Admin or PowerShell, you're doing this through a command interface, you can back up either the full server, which will back up all volumes, including the system state, or you can do a custom backup where you're backing up only select volumes. Again, you've got the ability to schedule using the task scheduler service. This enable system recovery thing is just a reminder that we do, in fact, have the capability to back up our system state. There's also a third piece here. Vista gave us the ability to do a complete PC backup and a complete PC restore. Sure enough, the Windows Server 2008 DVD gives us that capability as well. And down at the bottom of this whiteboard, under Restore Options, one option is, and this is a replacement for a horrible technology you might remember from Windows Server 2003 called the Automated System Recovery, or ASR. I don't even want to talk about it. It brings back bad memories. Now it's called Complete PC Backup and Complete PC Restore. That functionality still exists for Server 08. You won't see any references to it on your upgrade exam, so I'm just mentioning it here in passing. It's possible to do a Complete PC Restore by booting your Server 08 DVD and selecting this as a recovery option. More likely, though, you'll remember Directory Services Restore Mode from Server 03. This is a special boot option when you press F8 during a reboot and it puts your Active Directory database offline. That is to say it's a normal boot and done only on a domain controller obviously. And your database is offline and obviously you'd need your database, your Active Directory database offline to do stuff like performing an offline defragmentation or a non-authoritative restore slash authoritative restore. To restart your domain controller in directory services restore mode in 08, there are a couple different ways to go about it. It's a little bit different. One method involves using the BCD edit command line tool. You might or might not know about this command line tool. It's a replacement for 
the boot.ini configuration file that we've had for a long, long time since the earliest days of Windows NT. What you're about to see at the start of this demo is something that I can essentially guarantee many new administrators to Windows 2008 have experienced and have scratched their head a little bit over. Watch this. I'm on DC Nugget 01, which you'll remember is a domain controller in the nuggetlab.com domain. Let's assume we want to perform a backup of just a few directories in the root of drive C. Experience will tell us that we will open up Start, Navigate to Administrative Tools, and look through those shortcuts. Sure enough, we'll find at the bottom of the list, Windows Server Backup. We'll give that guy a click and pause for refreshment. We see the MMC console fire up. We see the action pane connect to another computer. Hmm, we don't see much else though. You can perform a single backup or schedule a regular backup using this application. Well, so far things look promising, but then we see an informational message that tells us that Windows Server Backup is not installed on this computer. Moreover, the dialog goes on to inform us that to install Windows Server Backup, we have to open Server Manager and install the feature called Windows Server Backup. Hmm. Well, I've studied user interface design quite a bit, and there is an argument to be made. Why make an option available to a user if it's not available? I guess Microsoft's thought, I'm not trying to read too much into what the good men and women at Microsoft thought about this, but perhaps they figured, well, we'll put the shortcut in the menu so that engineers know that the option for backup exists, and then we'll just tell them to go ahead and fire up Server Manager and install the feature. Again, the notion is make sure to install as little as possible to reduce the attack surface of the server and go from there. At any rate, we'll find in our quick launch area the server manager shortcut and we'll fire up server manager and we'll load this Windows backup feature as a feature. We'll select the features node, right click, select add features, Remember that a feature is essentially a subcomponent. It's not as full scale or robust as a role. Let's scroll down to the bottom of the list. We have Windows Server Backup Features, a little plus sign. Let's expand that guy. And we have two options. One, Windows Server Backup that gives us the MMC console snap-in and the WB Admin tool. If we choose Command Line Tools, we also get our Windows PowerShell commandlet scripts. Well, I'm going to install everything for the sake of this demo. Now notice that we have a dependency. That is to say, if we choose to install the command line tools, we're also going to get the Windows PowerShell components added as well. It's nice that the dependency is automatically added. That's fine. I'll add that required feature in, and there it is showing up checked a little bit farther up the list. We'll click Next. And it's telling us in the confirmation window, we're now going to install Windows PowerShell, Windows Server Backup, and Command Line Tools. Now you know from your own experience that the version of PowerShell is only going to be as current as what's on the Windows Server 2008 DVD. So you may in fact want to go to the Microsoft.com website and make sure, or just frankly run Microsoft Update, to ensure that you're running the very latest version of Windows PowerShell. We'll click install and let this installation complete. Installation completed successfully. Let's close. And we can stay right here if we want to, but I'm not going to. As you know, I tend to want to go right to the administrative tools because, frankly, it's faster. So if we now reopen Windows Server Backup, we should be able to get our business done at this point. Okay, in a nutshell, here's what's going on with the Windows Server Backup interface, everyone. The main screen here is largely just metadata. You have your messages, and down at the bottom is just, again, more meta. It's just status. Your last backup, your next scheduled backup, and then a record of all backups. Over on the right, your action pane mirrors what's in your action menu. You can set up a backup schedule. You can do just a one-time backup. This is potentially confusing. You normally would use the restore command. Here, the word recover is used instead. Performance setting is where you get to your settings. And then connect to another computer 
is where you can establish a connection just like you can in any MMC console to another server. All right, let's click backup once and I'll just quickly show you how to set up a backup. Process is the same basically no matter what you're doing. All right, create a backup now using the same options that you used in the backup schedule wizard. So if you already set up a backup schedule, you can inherit all those options or since we haven't created a schedule, the different options is the only one available now. Let's click next. The two options here are full server in which we back up all of our server data applications and the system state or custom I want to exclude some volumes from this backup. Then select the backup items. You can select your volume. Enable system recovery is to include your system state or not. Simple as that. So you notice here that you're seeing some nomenclature or some terminology differences from server 03. You want to be careful to know those terminology differences, not just from your exam, for your exam purposes, but also for your career purposes. So enable system recovery deals with whether or not you're including your system state. All right. So we've got to include one volume at least. So you notice that the flexibility with the built-in Windows tool isn't as great as we might have thought it was in terms of this is either full server or volume level backup. So we're taking a, the C drive in this case and we're going to grab it and send it over the network to a remote shared folder. You notice I can't send it to a local drive because on my server I have only one drive, the C drive says that the destination can't be a critical volume like the C drive, which is the system drive. So we'll send it to a remote shared folder. Got Nugget 05. I'm going to send it to the public share over there. Access control. I'm going to choose Do Not Inherit, which makes the backup accessible only to the credentials I set in the next step, which are going to be the domain administrator. Nugget Lab Administrator. That's me. Are we going to do a VSS copy backup or a VSS full? We're going to leave the applications alone, so we're going to choose the recommended option, VSS copy backup. There's our confirmation. So we'll click backup, and there we go. Before we move on to our next subject, which is quotas, NTFS quotas, and a review of resource manager quotas from our last nugget, let's consider the subject of restore using Windows Server Backup. We'll see here that I aborted my backup that I started. You can tell that by looking in the main portion of our window here. You see our messages. I double left clicked the message. We see here that I transferred about three quarters of a gigabyte. It was a full backup. The operation has been stopped. Status failed. Down at the bottom, our status, the last backup failed. View detailed, it brings up the same thing that we saw by double clicking up here. Now if we stretch out our Actions pane, we can click Recover to start a restore process. Again, it's the same kind of thing. We get started, select the backup date, select the recovery type, what do you want to recover, recovery options, confirmation, and recovery process. The first step is to decide whether we're going to recover data from this server or another server. Of course, we have to have a backup in order to get any progress going here. All right, now I opened up an administrative command prompt behind the scenes in between recording the last movie and this one. And I just want to show you a little bit about that WB admin tool. Now at first glance, and you'll see this when you're working with Windows 08, you start a backup job, it's not intuitively obvious how to stop it. I mean, there's, it's not like there are VCR controls here, start, pause, play, that kind of stuff. There really aren't. So your best bet is to pop open a command prompt and use wbadmin stop job. And when you issue that command, the return is, are you sure you want to stop the current job? Y for yes and for no. I typed Y and it stopped. Simple as that. So of course, as you know, wbadmin forward slash question mark gives you a run of the supported commands. You can enable a backup that will enable or modify a scheduled daily backup, disable a backup, there's start backup, stop job, get versions, get items, start recovery, get status, and so on. So there's not all that many commands that are used with WB Admin. So much for that. Now, 
You saw how to back up the system state. What if your registry or your Active Directory database gets corrupted? What can you do about it? Well, one feature of Active Directory that's pretty cool that's brand new in Server 08 is the restartable Active Directory domain services. You need to know about that. You do a start run and type services.msc to open up your Service Control Manager application. You will see in that services list an entry called Active Directory Domain Services. It shows up right along with all your other services. And if you right click that guy, you can stop or restart Active Directory now. Isn't that great? So, assuming you have more than one domain controller, the idea is you don't always have to restart into Directory Services Restore mode to perform, for instance, an authoritative or non authoritative restore or an offline defragmentation of your directory services database. You can simply stop ADDS, do your deal, and then start it. Of course, the database is offline when you stop the service. That's cool, isn't it? I just wanted to give you a heads up on how easy it is to do that. Also wanted to show you two other ways, if you do need to restart into directory services restore mode, to do that. Now you remember, start run MS config. That tool's been around for a long, long time. It's the System Configuration Tool. On the Boot tab, you can select under Boot Options, Safe Boot, Active Directory Repair, and then OK. That's one easy way to do it. Third way, let me type CLS to clear our screen. You can type BCD Edit. Remember, this is our replacement for Boot Any. Forward slash question mark gives you a lot of help as far as how to use it. BCD Edit is our boot configuration data store editor. And specifically, you'd do BCD Edit forward slash set. Set is used to set a parameter, of course. Safe boot DS repair. You'd hit that. It would accept that. And then you might have used, I know I've used it a lot, the shutdown command to force a shutdown minus R to force a reboot. Now, if your system is hosed, I hope it isn't, you can always throw in the F flag to force that reboot to happen. So those are a couple ways to reboot your system into directory services restore mode if you need to do that. Disk quotas in Windows Server 2008. In the last nugget, I showed you resource manager quotas. This was a dramatic improvement to how disk quotas worked prior to the R2 update to Windows Server 03, and this is fully carried over and improved upon in Windows Server 2008. So you need to know now that there are two types of quotas. Quota, of course, is a limitation of disk space usage. You need to know, first of all, the NTFS, or the New Technology File System Quota, traditional quota that you're used to in the Windows Server 2003 RTM world, is a volume quota. These are done on a per user basis. You remember how those work. You could set a quota on say your drive D or your drive E and you would create what are called quota entries such that Joe user has 500 megs, Jane user has a gig, administrators were exempt from those NTFS quotas. There wasn't really that much of a notification scheme. Maybe an event log entry was written. Very limited, very limited. If you had home folders, for instance, it was extremely hard to get those to work. In fact, you couldn't use NTF, you can't use, even in Server 08, NTFS quotas with individual folders. With R2 and Windows Server 08, the resource manager quotas can be done finally at a folder level. They affect any user or group who accesses that folder. And of course, we've got additional things like the file screens, and the file groups and the quota templates that are just wonderful. I'm big fans of those. Now, I don't know why I put RM there. Quota terminology in general is a point of review. We know that quota limits are either hard or soft. Hard means that the user or group cannot save any more data to that volume or that folder once they hit their hard quota limit. Soft means that a notification is raised when the user or group hits their quota limit but they can still go beyond it. It's up to you and or your organizational structure which way you want to go. A quota template is a reusable construct that defines a warning level and an upper limit. 
Simple as that. Now then, managing disk quotas. NTFS quotas are handled in the properties of each volume. We go into My Computer, right-click a volume, go to Properties, they're done through there. Resource Manager quotas, on the other hand, you remember from the last nugget, we'll do a very brief review. We install the File Services role, and we go into the File Server Resource Manager. We can set up quota templates, quotas, file screens, and storage reports. Let's have a look at quotas, shall we? First, let's look at the classic NTFS volume quotas that you recall from RTM Windows Server 2003 and are carried forward to Windows Server 2008, I suspect mainly for backward compatibility reasons. We'll open Start. We're on DC Nugget 01 still, by the way. And we'll click Computer to open up the traditional My Computer. As I told you, we can access NTFS volume quotas by right-clicking the volume in question and selecting Properties from the shortcut menu. On that shortcut menu, we'll navigate to the Quota tab. This is pretty standard fare, exactly the same as Windows Server 2003. Disk quotas are disabled by default. We can flip the master switch by enabling Quota Management. Notice that quotas are soft by default. To turn them hard, we simply enable Deny Disk Space to Users Exceeding Quota Limit. Now, to set the stage to make this more real world, let me show you my drive C. I have a folder called Resources with two shared folders within it, one called Documents that contains some Word 2007 files, another called Reports that contains some Excel 2007 files. Let's say that we wanted to limit a user named Nugget user and let's say members of his work group to 10 megs of space just for the documents folder. How can we do that and can we do that using NTFS quotas? There's the question. 10 megs. I know that that's low by the way but this is just an example. It's an academic example. Well if we enable quota management and make it a hard quota we're not going to limit disk usage. We're going to want to limit disk space to. We're going to change the 1 to a 10. KB is pretty strict, isn't it? We can go MB, GB, TB, petabyte, and exabyte. Wow, now that's Microsoft thinking of the future, isn't it? We'll choose MB. The warning level, why don't we make it 8 megabyte. Select the quota logging options. Note the only notification option is to log the event in the server event logs. Now, do you see anything wrong with this picture? Well, hang on just a second. Let's finish this configuration. The quota entries, as I said before, is where we can bring per user effect to our NTFS quotas. The administrators of the server are always exempt from our NTFS quotas, as well they should. If we click New Quota Entry, we can bring in Nugget user, we can resolve his name, and we can change the default. What I just set was a global default. I can just for grins, let's give him 12 instead of 10. And we'll set his warning to 10 instead of 8. You see? So now Nugget user has a little bit more space than the rest of his work group does. Now, what's the problem here? You should enable the quota system only if you tend to use quotas on this disk volume. When you enable the quota system, the volume will be rescanned. This might take several minutes. Let me click Cancel. If I click Cancel, it turns everything off. Yikes, that's potentially a lot of work that I just lost. The problem is, NTFS quotas affect the entire volume. If I was on a file server, which I probably would be, and I was on, say, drive D, which could have terabytes of disk space and could have dozens of shared folders, and I limit a user to 500 megs, then I'm potentially hosing that user out of a lot of potential disk space. So I'm just trying to underline that you want to be really careful when you're using these NTFS disk quotas. They're very, very limited. In Windows Server 2008, you really want to use the File Server Resource Manager to do your quotas wherever possible. Therefore, this may be one of those cases where there's the real-world answer and the Microsoft answer. Know about NTFS volume quotas for your 649 exam? 
and certainly know about file server resource manager quotas for your exam. But in the real world, you want to make sure to install the file server resource manager as a role service and concentrate on it. Now I have that open. I've installed this role already on DC Nugget 01. I've opened up file server resource manager from the administrative tools folder already. And I've also taken the liberty under quota management to create myself a quota template called 10 MB template. This is a hard quota. Let me double left click it. It's a hard quota at 10 megs, and I've set a warning level at 90% that writes to the Windows Server event log when that threshold is reached. You'll remember that we have much more flexibility of notification in Server 08. Finally, I'm going to go to the Quotas node and create myself a quota. Now the path here is important. I didn't mention this in the last nugget. But you can create a quota on a single path, which is what I'm going to do right now. But there's an important question that I know a lot of you will have. If you look on my C drive here, I have a shared folder called Home. Let me go to Properties. I know that as Windows administrators, you're going to have a Home folder path that looks something like mine, that it's shared under Home Dollar, that it's a hidden share that contains all of your users' home directories. I just have four here. You might have 400. You don't want to create quotas separately for all 400 of your users or 4,000 of your users. So what you can do is create a quota on your home folder share. You'd point to the root of that shared folder. And then you can choose Auto Apply Template and Create Quotas on Existing and New Subfolders. Isn't that awesome? So you can cascade your quota through the entire home folder structure. I love that. In this case, though, I'm going to create the folder just on a single path. So why don't I navigate into C, Resources, Documents. And I'm going to drive the properties from that new quota template I created offline, 10 MB template. There. So now I've got myself a quota. Last thing to do is to test it. I'm on Nugget 5 now. This is a Windows Vista workstation. It's a member of the NuggetLab.com domain. What I'm going to do here is a Windows R. I hate how the run box is hidden by default, don't you? And I'm going to do a whack whack DC nugget 01 just to establish a connection to that server. Make our window a little bit smaller here. We'll hit up the documents share. You'll remember this is the one that does have that 10 megabyte cap on it. We'll change to list view. I've got a dummy docs folder that's got plenty O resources in it. Again, let's resize the window, give ourselves some room to maneuver, and let's see what happens as we start to hit that cap. Grab a bunch of files here. I don't know how big these files are, how long it'll take us to reach the cap. I think we've got some photography files here. Shouldn't take us too long to reach our 10 meg cap if we start adding some pictures. There we go. There's not enough space on documents. You need an additional 3.98 megs to copy these files. There it is. So it looks like our hard quota is fine. We're being notified exactly as we should. And moreover, the Windows Server 2008 box is telling us exactly by how much we've exceeded the quota. This gives the user enough grist for the mill to call the help desk, to file a ticket, whatever, and notify the appropriate party what's going on. Configuring print services in Windows Server 2008. Historically, deploying printer connections in Windows Server has been kind of a headache, and traditionally, at least in my personal experience, has required a fair amount of what's called sneaker net, visiting the user's computer. Admittedly, this notion of point and print has made printer deployment a lot easier, such that, at least in my experience, involves just simply opening up the printer's folder on the user's computer, establishing a UNC connection to the print server, and simply dragging and dropping the printer icon from the server to the user's computer. So it's not as bad, but automating the procedure traditionally involves using stuff like logon scripts and the old ancient command of mapping a parallel port or a virtual parallel port to the user's computer. I mean that stuff is antiquated. Forget about it, right?
We want to use group policy objects wherever possible to deploy printers. And as I made reference to in the opening of this nugget, Windows Server 2003 R2 gave us the print management console and an easy way to deploy printers and print drivers to our compatible client computers. In Windows Server 2008, it's even more streamlined. What we do is install the print services role first of all. Optionally, we can use stuff like Active Directory location tracking, although that's kind of, I'm not going to say going the way of the dodo, but it's not as important as it used to be. In a nutshell, Active Directory location tracking involves stuff that we've already talked about. You remember the notion of Active Directory sites and subnets, such that users can more efficiently contact domain controllers based on their site membership and their subnet associations? Well, you could make it easier for users to find printers that are physically closest to them by associating those printers with sites and subnets and giving them easy to recognize names as well. However, with print services and group policy deployments, it's even easier to deploy now. Once you've installed the print services role, you use the print management console. You can easily swap and migrate and consolidate your printers. I mean, traditionally, if you're like me, printers tend to be kind of like spaghetti. You've got print servers all over your domain or your domains, and it can be difficult to know who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third, in terms of which printer hosts which queues. Here you can easily import and export printer queues and so forth. Next is the idea of updating drivers, managing printer drivers, advertising printers in Active Directory to make them easier to find, and then finally deploying printers to users via Active Directory. Again, it's just so much easier than it used to be. I dare say that it's almost a joy to administer print services in Windows Server 2008. Alrighty then, let's remember that the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Or, or no, wait a minute, that's another Nugget series, excuse me. No, this demo is dealing with print services in Windows Server 2008. Oh, that's right, I lost my head there for a minute. We're on DC Nugget 01, and instead of going through the Add Roles wizard in Server Manager, I think it's about time that we go about this in a different way. I think it's a little treat for us, too. Let's do a Windows R, fire up, well, no, scratch that. Let's open up the Start menu and right-click the command prompt and select Run as Administrator. Sometimes getting used to this elevated command prompt business takes a little bit of getting used to. We're going to use Server Manager CMD to install this role, right? We need to make sure to try as many different things and different ways of doing things as possible in Server 08. We want to be well-rounded Windows administrators. I'll do a CD backslash and CLS, whoops, CD backslash to get down to the root of C, CLS to clear the decks, and let's do a Server Manager CMD forward slash question mark to get a run of our, our syntax. Basically it works like this. You do server manager CMD space and then minus keyword and it could be query to display a list of any installed roles, role services, or features that are currently installed. We're concerned with the install command. We're going to basically do server manager CMD minus install space and then the name of the role. You can get a list of all the available role, role service, and feature keywords just by going to our friend Google. Just do a Google search for Server Manager CMD Syntax, and it'll tell you everything you need to know, okay? So let's rock and roll here. Server Manager CMD minus install. And I've done my homework so I know that the print services role looks like that. Print dash services. Now I happen to know that print services has a couple other role services. There's the LPR daemon that would allow Unix Linux clients to print to this Windows Server 2008 machine. There's also the Internet Printing Protocol or IPP daemon that's been around for a while since Windows 2000 server actually. I'm not going to install any of those subcomponents. I just want the raw print services role. So We'll leave it at that, press enter, and away we go. Great news. 
To quote George Papard from The A-Team, I am a child of the 80s, by the way. I love it when a plan comes together. Installation succeeded. We'll use the exit command to close our command window. We'll fire up administrative tools, and we'll look for the appropriate shortcut icon. There it is, print management. I'm happy to introduce you to this print management console. It's going to make your lives a lot easier, I think. It consists of three pieces or three components. One, custom filters, which is going to make it a lot easier for you to, at a glance, let's expand this, to filter your view for printers, let's say printers from a certain location, printers from a certain building, a certain floor, etc., drivers of a certain manufacturer, so on, printers that are in a not ready state, printers that contain jobs. You can create your own custom filters, by the way. You just right click, choose Add New Printer Filter. It's a really nifty feature in this print management console. Under Print Servers, of course, we just have the local one here, but if we right click, choose Add Remove Servers, you can bring in all of the print servers in your domain or forest depending upon your credentials. Very nice indeed. If we expand the server, you can see individually installed drivers, forms, paper tray capabilities based on the printers that are installed, ports, and then finally printers. Then the last node are printers that are currently deployed and how they're deployed per user GPO or per machine GPO. Pretty straightforward, right? So your very first task would be to decide whether you're going to consolidate your print servers into your current console or not. Remember, you can download the Windows Server 2008 management tools to your Windows Vista or potentially your Windows XP Service Pack 2, Service Pack 3 workstation and work from there if you want to. It doesn't have to be from a Server 08 box. As far as consolidating your printers, as I referenced earlier, if you right-click the Print Management heading, you have Add Remove Servers, as I said before, and you have Migrate Printers. Getting started with printer migration, export printer queues and printers to a file, import printer queues and printer drivers from a file. So I, right now I have, let me cancel, if I select Printers, I have two printers in my queue. I've got an XPS document writer. That came to me because I have on this machine a couple of the Office 2007 apps installed. I also have an HP LaserJet 4250, just a virtual printer installed, the driver. I don't physically have that printer up. But at any rate, let me right click here and migrate printers. I'm going to choose to export these to a file. Now note that you can directly migrate these to another print server. You don't have to just export to a file. I'm going to do that right now. Let's choose to browse out to the desktop, print config. Export complete. Let's finish, minimize, and there it is. You can just double click this on the target computer and it'll import those directly into the print management machine on that target computer. Very cool, huh? All right, very, very quickly, let me show you how to add a printer. Right click the printer node, Add printer. You can search the network. You can add a TCP IP port, which is common if you've got a network printer, which is definitely the case in 2008. You can add a new printer using an existing local port or an existing TCP IP port if you have one. Create a new port and add a new printer. In my case, my experience, add a TCP IP port. If the printer is already out on the network, it already is online, already has an IP address, you choose that option, choose TCP IP device, give it an IP address. You've seen this stuff before, right? We choose what kind of LAN card the printer has. My experience, I've got lots of experience with HP Jet Direct cards. I'll choose it. Of course, there's no driver. We could if we haven't, if it's the same kind of printer we already have in the hopper. We can choose that driver, but this isn't. We're going to install a new driver. Let's assume that this is a 4350 PostScript printer. We'll edit the share name. Cool. Our printer's been installed successfully. Let's click Finish. There it is.
Let's tweak up the properties on this guy really quick. Let's right click, go to properties, go to security, we'll click add, we'll say authenticated users are allowed to print, and we're going to select everyone and remove those guys. Let's go over to sharing. We are sharing the printer. We're going to list this guy in directory. That means we're going to register this printer in Active Directory to make it easier to find. That also covers an exam objective. Final thing, we're going to right click. I'm going to show you how easy it is to put this printer queue out on the network in Group Policy. We'll right click and choose Deploy with Group Policy. First question is what GPO are we associating this printer with? We'll click Browse. Right now I haven't added any GPOs. We can look at the domain OU level the site level, or everything. I'm going to choose default domain policy, and then we can filter the scope of this policy per user or per machine. I'm going to go per machine. We'll say this printer is going to have as wide a scope as possible. As Soon as I click the add button here, you notice down below we have our UNC path to the printer. It's registered with the default domain policy, and the connection type is per machine. We'll click Apply. The changes are applied. Printer deployment succeeded. And we'll click Details. It doesn't tell us anything we don't already know. Now if we come down to Deployed Printers, we can see at a glance what's just happened. Let's quickly test, and we're finished with this Nugget. Final step in this process is to log on to Nugget05, our Windows Vista NuggetLab.com member workstation, and verify that that group policy is absorbed properly. Let's press Control alt delete to log on. I'm logging on as a domain user named Nugget User. Let's close out of our welcome screen. Open up Start. Type Printer. We'll open our Printers folder. And sure enough, there it is, HP LaserJet 4350 on DC Nugget 01. We didn't know, we as end user didn't know how it got there. We don't need to know how it got there. We just know that it did. Administering File and Print Services Part 2. In this nugget, we first examined the Windows Server 2008 backup and restore utilities, both the graphical as well as the command line. I hope you feel more comfortable with using those and you're equipped to answer any questions you might see on your 7649 exam on that subject. We then did some review from our previous nugget on resource manager quotas and also some review from further back from your 03 days on NTFS volume quotas. Finally, we examined print services in Windows Server 2008 which is a huge improvement from what we had as far as deploying printers in previous versions of Windows Server products and technologies. This was an excellent, very useful nugget, even if I do say so myself, both from an exam preparation standpoint as well as one of professional development. I hope that this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you very much for viewing.